If you're just starting out learning visual effects, you might want to jump to the most interesting shot that you can do. However, in this video, I hope to show why mastering the simple visual effects is so important. Before we jump into it, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of my Patreon members. If you are interested in joining or learning about any of the perks I offer, I'll have a link to join down below. Also, I just quickly wanted to say I just released a new visual effects course talking about everything visual effects advertising. And so I'll have that along with some of my other courses down below if you do want a more slow paced beginner friendly environment. OK, so let's go ahead and jump in the video. So today I want to hammer home why it's so important to start out simple with your visual effects. And what I mean by that is literally uh, today all we're going to look at is how to put a CGI object into an environment in a still image, uh, you know, making it as easy as possible in every single aspect. And so as you can see here, we basically have, uh, you know, this shot right here and we're adding a CGI uh, cat statue to this. And so basically what I want to drive home with this is we want to make this uber realistic. We want to get all of the variable variables out so that we can make this look as realistic as it looks right now. Um, you can see over here, if I kind of check this, uh, this is purely what we're doing inside of Blender. And then in the compositing process is when we're really breaking it down all the way down to the pixel level to get exact kind of re results like this. You can uh, really tell down in the shadows uh you know the connection point and everything it looks a lot more realistic uh, and this is some of the stuff that clients are going to be looking for and breaking down so it's really really important if you're starting out for visual effects to really nail down those concepts it might not be as flashy or as interesting but trust me when people look at demo reels and stuff like that they are going to be looking for that level of detail and so it's really important to nail that down Okay, so what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to go out and find a photo, not a video. We're going to keep it super simple, just a still photograph that we're going to use to place a CGI object into some things to look out for. And that will definitely help us along inside of Blender uh, is we want a flat ground. So you can see here, this is the photo that I chose uh, just because it has a flat ground here. If you get a little bit more into, uh, you know, ground geometry and stuff like that, it is going to be a little bit more difficult to deal, especially with the shadows. And so again, in the nature of this video, I want to keep it super simple. So let's do a flat ground. Uh, you can use this image. I'll provide a link down below, but I strongly suggest you find your own image. The other caveat uh, that I also want you to find in this photograph, whatever photograph you choose, we want a solid color for the ground. Uh, that's going to be very important because it's basically going to provide some bounce sliding onto our object. So right here, you can see we pretty much just have a tan ground that uh, is going to be below our object. And the final kind of thing that I want you to find in whatever photograph that you use, uh, again, uh, you can use this one or any other one that you want. Uh, is I want you guys to find something that is sunlit. So you can see over here, this is just a super simple scene with a blue sky and sunlighting. No other complicated lighting setups such as lamp posts, uh, you know, lamps inside. Interiors are especially more difficult for beginners. So those are the three things. So uh, flat ground, uh, solid color ground, and then a sunlit scene. And so hopefully you can find that. Again, I'll use this picture for the rest of this tutorial. OK, so go ahead and download whatever photo that you're going to use. Next thing we need to do is find out what object that we're going to put into the scene. And so I'm not going to be worrying about modeling, texturing, anything like that. A great resource that I actually found is using this website called Polyhaven. Polyhaven has a bunch of great resources such as textures, HDRIs, which is uh, what we're going to be using in a little bit to get our lighting in our scene. But more importantly for now is models. And the nice thing about this site is it actually provides a Blender file. And so up here you can see it actually gives you a Blender file with this for free. It's amazing. Highly, highly recommend you guys check this out if you are a beginner. It gets out a lot of those things that you don't want to have to deal with uh, and you'll learn later on in the process. So, uh, you know, this is where you can be a little bit more creative. You can find whatever kind of model that you want to use uh, for your own scene. I actually believe I ended up using a cat statue. And so this is one I'm going to be using today. So you can come down here. You can see all of the maps that it kind of offers all of the textures. Again, since you are a beginner, let's not worry about that. This does all of the work for you. And so all you have to do is just come up here and choose the texture size. I'm going to stick to 2K. And then uh, you do want to make sure you're selecting the Blender file. And then let's go ahead and just download that. Uh, so again, just, you know, we need an image and then an object that we're going to use to place in that image. 
Okay, so now that we have that explained, let's go ahead and jump into the visual effects side of things. So the first thing that we need to do is we basically need to take our photograph and recreate the camera that was shot uh, with that photograph. And so this is going to be different depending on what photo that you actually use. What I'm going to be using today is a program called FSpy, which basically allows us to recreate the camera uh, exactly inside of the 3D space. And so you want to go ahead and download the FSpy program along with the FSpy importer add-on. Let's just go ahead and download the add-on first of all. So if we come up to edit and then preferences, we can go to the add-on section. Then you just want to hit install and you want to locate wherever you installed that zip file. Uh, I'll have a link to that down below for both the program and the add-on. And so just go ahead and install that wherever you have that zip file installed. Then uh, you should come back out here and if it's installed correctly, it should pop up in this menu. And so you should be seeing something like this. You just want to make sure we have that checked. And so uh, you can see mine is checked right here. We can X that off here and uh, just to double check that everything is installed correctly. We can go to file and then import. And at the very bottom, you should see a dot FSpy import option. Next, you just want to go ahead and go through the installation process for FSpy. I believe it's super, super simple. Literally just double clicking the EXE and then downloading that. Uh, once that is downloaded, it should automatically pop up, but you just want to run the program. And so now we're in the program. Let's go ahead and drop whatever image that you are using we want to drop that into the program so we're just going to drag and drop there and so fspy is a great program to give us a lot of kind of camera data that we don't already have since we didn't shoot this camera ourselves uh, and so most importantly it's going to give us a focal length and then it's also going to determine our vanishing points and so that's going to give us the correct orientation inside of blender it's a great resource to use so let's dim the image off. And I basically want to line some of these lines around the scene. So uh, let's think about this. Uh, first of all, I want to figure out where I want the CGI because this influences a lot of uh, this process right here. So of course, uh, for my scene, I'm going to place the CGI over here. And so hopefully with your own footage, uh, you will be able to select some of these lines based on, uh, you know, whatever kind of photo that you chose. So since I want my CGI over here, I want to stick uh, all of these lines kind of over here uh, to be as accurate as possible so let's come over here i'm going to place the y line uh, along this kind of line here it might be a little bit hard to see on youtube uh, but what you can do is you can hold shift and it'll kind of zoom in a little bit and so you can barely tell it right there and then i'm going to place this line over here as well so right there so that is the y line we do need to place the other one and so uh, we do want to make sure that both of these lines are basically parallel to each other in the 3d space and so I'll notice we have this nice garage kind of shadow line down here. So I'll kind of use the bottom of that shadow to be our other Y line. So right there. So yeah, so now we have the Y axis basically defined and it's going to give us some really good rotation inside of Blender. Let's go ahead and do the X axis. Uh, you can also change the axes if you want to do the Z axis. You can also do that as well. But we actually have some pretty good uh, X axes right here. Uh, the only thing to take into account is X and Y are perpendicular to each other inside of Blender. If you actually come up here, you can see exactly uh, what I'm talking about up here. We have the Z the Y and then the X and all of those are basically perpendicular to each other. And so we have to make sure that we follow that rule inside of F spy as well. And so let's come back to F spy and in the uh, X uh, line up here, let's just place this along this crack. So again, just holding shift to zoom in and then let's uh, place the other side over here. Again, I do want to make sure both of the X lines are going to be parallel to each other. So uh, I know in the real world, you know, basically this uh, driveway, these lines are, you know, pretty much parallel. It might not be perfect, uh, but it's going to give us a totally fine result uh, because this is a still uh, photograph. And so uh, this is looking pretty good to me. Uh, some tests I like to kind of run is I can place this origin point. This is going to be the origin point of our scene inside of Blender. But I just want to place that wherever I want my CGI. And so my CGI is going to be around here. That's where I'm going to place my origin point. And then let's go ahead and and, uh, do the XY grid floor and now you can see it's basically uh, this is what the grid floor is going to be inside of blender and so it matches up perfectly and so yes yeah, so that's pretty much it It gives us a nice uh, field of view and focal length over here so you can tell we have basically a 34 focal length so that's going to be really good to match our scene as realistically as possible so let's uh, I'm going to control s to save this project you can name it whatever you want I'm just going to version it like that and now we are done inside of s by let's exit out of here and and now uh, I'm going to hit A and D uh, delete to delete everything in my scene. I just want to start exactly from scratch for this beginner tutorial.
So yeah, so now we pretty much have our camera set up. Um, let's actually import in that data from SPY into this Blender project. And so that's super easy. Again, go ahead and download that add-on. Uh, but we just need to go to file import and then fspy and let's just locate that fspy project we just made okay so here is mine i'm just going to select that and import that in and now you can see it's automatically created a new camera inside of our thing uh, if we go into the camera properties we can see that it has uh, the exact field of view that we had inside of the program uh, you know i showed you the focal length and so it also has that focal length number and there is just kind of a, another unit we can uh, determine that and so yes yeah, so you can see that 34 number is uh, you know defined in everything and so now if we shift a we're going to add a mesh plane and now you can see if we g shift uh, z we can move it around the floor plane and everything is looking like it's tracked and um, you know going along that ground plane uh, that is very very important i find too many beginners don't really set the correct focal length or uh, get the ground rotation or anything right and then it ends up looking a little bit wonky in terms of your cg it looks like your cg might not be sitting perfectly on the ground plane of the footage so that's a very important process to get uh, correct uh, especially if you're about to go into camera tracking uh, i know this tutorial we're not going to deal with it because i want to stay as simple as possible but it is very important for camera tracking to have the right uh, focal length and so uh, that's just kind of the process we use there Okay, so we pretty much have this uh, default scene set up. We already have uh, the camera in our scene. Let's go ahead and go to Cycles because uh, Cycles is going to be the better render engine to use for visual effects. Uh, I don't really find anybody uses EV uh, besides, you know, animators and stuff like that. Uh, so really, Cycles is going to be our best uh, kind of use case scenario. Just uh, some of the light calculations are a little bit better with Cycles. Uh, now, if you have a dedicated graphics card, let's go ahead and set GPU compute. And then I want to go ahead and denoise the viewport just so everything isn't noisy and grainy. And we can actually tell what it's going to look like in the final render. So let's go ahead and we have this uh, default scene set up. Let's go ahead and add in that CG, uh, CGI model or uh, whatever you want to place in the scene, we want to go ahead and place that in. So what I like to do is let's go ahead and right click. I'm going to create a new collection and I'm just going to name that collection cat for me, but um, you know, name it whatever you want there. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to basically start uh, organizing stuff so that later on we can uh, render out di uh, different things and different CGI passes. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's why I'm creating that. Let's go ahead and uh, import that in the scene. And so if you remember before, when we were downloading our CGI model that we're going to be placing in our scene uh, from Polyhaven, we went ahead and selected the blender option. And that's going to be really nice because it's going to give us a blender scene. And so it's going to make the import process super quick and easy. All we need to do if we have a blender scene is let's just go up to file and append. And then let's locate that, uh, you know, wherever you have that saved. Okay, so here's the folder that I placed my download into. You might have to extract uh, some of these files out, but the nice thing is it comes with a blend file and also a textures folder, and it does a pretty good job of uh, linking those two, so you shouldn't run into any issues there. All we want to do is we want to select that blend file. Let's go into the object settings, and this one is very nice. Some might have multiple objects in the blender uh, file. However, this one is just a one singular object. So you just want to select everything there, and let's append that into our scene. And so now you can see, uh, you know, it's in our folder, which is nice, but now we actually have our cat model into our scene right here. So the other thing that I always find that beginners uh, really struggle with is uh, finding the correct scale of a scene. And so what I mean by, by that is uh, we need to basically uh, scale this scene so that it is the exact scale as our real life uh, kind of objects and stuff in our scene. And so uh, the reason that's very important, by the way, is for, um, you know, many different things such as depth of field. If you have any, you know, focus racking or anything like that, Blender actually uses accurate data uh, to the real world. And so we want to make sure our scale is set up correctly for that. Uh, the more important thing is going to be for shadow fall off. And so the further away a uh, shadow is from an object, uh, the more hazy and the more uh, soft that shadow is going to be. And so if we set up these uh, scale incorrectly, that shadow fall off is going to look very wonky and not give us accurate results. However, if we do set up our scale correctly, it's going to give us much more real world uh, results and look a lot more natural. And so uh, in order to go ahead and do that, what we need to do is we basically need to define a uh, object inside of here that, uh, you know, we give it a set size and then we can scale our entire scene to that size. 
And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to use my CGI object. Uh, I basically want this statue right here. I want this statue to be six feet tall. And so that's super easy to do inside of Blender. Let's hit N to go to this side panel over here. And in the item tab up in the top, we can see all of this information. Uh, that down at the very bottom, we can see these dimensions. So these dimensions are going to basically uh, tell Blender, hey, this thing is, uh, you know, for now it's 0.283 meters. And so uh, that's in the Z direction. And so the Z direction is the up and down direction. I basically want that uh, number to be six feet. Um, now, shout out to this user. Thank you so much for telling me this. I never knew about this. Uh, but what we can actually do is let's put in uh, just six and then FT for feet and press enter. It'll automatically do the calculation for us uh, into meters. And so just a quick. Uh, kind of tip there so thank you to that user again uh, so yeah so now you can see our uh, cat is you know six feet tall in the real world and so that is basically like that it looks super wonky now and that's just because over here the scale uh, for the z is 6.4 but the x and y has not changed so all we need to do is let's just copy uh, the 6.4 uh, number and we'll just copy and paste those in the x and y axes as well and so now it's the exact same uh, cat kind of dimensions and everything uh, just scaled like that and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and control A to apply our scale. So uh, again, I'm just going to control A, hit S to scale. And now these numbers are basically one over here. And so uh, that, you know, happens uh, is a good kind of rule of thumb and, you know, uh, to always apply your scale if you ever do that. So, yeah, so this is a six foot cat now. So let's uh, double check that this is accurate. Uh, so what I can do is we have this garage back here. What I'm going to do is G shift Z. We'll just move this cat kind of back here. So it's touching the garage. So you can see that uh, the garage from top to bottom is basically six feet. Um, I believe garages in the U S uh, typically are around, uh, you know, eight to 10 feet. Um, and so we want to try to match this as much as possible now in order to actually affect the scale. Uh, but again, we don't want to affect our uh, cat statue because that is correctly scaled. Uh, we're basically using the cat as reference for the scale on our scene. So uh, the way I like to do it inside of Blender, there are many ways to affect that scale is I like to shift A. We're going to add a empty and plane axis. And now you can see our plane axis is in the middle of our origin. And so now what I want to do is I want to parent my camera so that the empty is basically affecting my camera. And so that's super easy. Let's uh, select my camera up here. Shift select the empty and I'm going to hit control P and parent to object. And so now what that has done is if I select my empty over here uh, and I hit G or, you know, R, S, uh, all that stuff, it actually uh, moves around my camera as well. The nice thing about that is now with the empty selected, if I hit S to scale, we can see that our, um, you know, cat is getting smaller. If I actually bring a new window out here, I can just kind of demonstrate this a little bit better. Uh, but as you can see, if I hit S to scale, our cat is not moving. However, our camera is moving. And since that empty is on the ground plane, it's actually not affecting any of the orientation or anything we did inside of F spot. And so that's a really good uh, kind of process to do there. So uh, now all we have to do is just uh, scale this cat down. So it would be basically about six feet. And so I would imagine in this, uh, you know, kind of world, uh, six feet would roughly be like around this line for the garage uh, you know i'm kind of just guesstimating there uh if i actually took this footage in the real world uh you know a data wrangler or something like that uh, would actually be taking real world measurements for us cgi artists to be uh, using for the scale of the scene and so if you've ever heard of a data wrangler that's just one of their kind of jobs that they would do anyways let's hit s to scale this up and i basically just want to scale up my cat so it's roughly around there i, I think that would be around like six feet give or take uh, again we do just want to kind of double check and yeah so if i place my cat around uh you know in the z space where the uh, garage would be that's roughly six feet and so yeah so that is now the scale set up correctly uh now you know specifically for this use case since i'm not animating the camera or anything what i can actually do is i want to go ahead and delete this empty and just get it out of my scene if i go ahead and delete it you can see our scale is you know reset back to its original position and that's because it's just deleting all of that information we're actually not giving any information to the camera it's only being applied to the empty so what we need to do is let's go ahead and with our camera, we need to unparent the camera to the empty. So if we right click, we can go to parent and we want to clear parent and then keep the transformation. And so that's going to give us exactly what we want. So let's again, right click, 
go to parent and cle uh, clear and keep transformation. So now you can see nothing has happened. And, but now if we go ahead and delete our empty, since it's not parented anymore, it's not changing the scale and everything. Uh, just clears out a little bit of space. We don't really need that empty anymore anyways. So yeah, so that's pretty much how to set up the scale of the scene. And so yeah, so that's pretty much how to set up the scale of our scene. Now we are actually ready to start uh, kind of, you know, getting ready to light this thing and get it looking realistic. So let's come and uh, if you have uh, Z, we can go to the render view. And first of all, I want to position where my CGI is going to be. So I'm going to R Z. We're just going to move that over here. And then uh, I might want it a little bit bigger in the frame. So we'll move it here and then hit just S to scale that up. So yeah, so roughly around there, you know, we can play around with this as we go. Uh, but yeah, now you can see we basically have my CGI exactly where I want it in my scene. It is on the floor plane. You always have to kind of double check that. Um, these models are pretty good with having it uh, kind of defaultly set on the floor plane. Uh, but yeah, so now you can see everything is on that floor plane. That's again, just something we set up with S spy that you just always want to double check. Anyways, we pretty much have all of this set up. Let's talk about how to actually add some lighting and get this looking to a more professional result so let's go ahead and come over here we want to go to the world properties and the world properties is uh, basically all of the lighting in our scene uh, by now uh, you know right now everything's just this gray color and so you can actually change around the color you know so if I wanted it a brighter we'll say like red or something like that it's actually affecting the lighting of our scene so we actually don't want that of course uh, it's not a red uh, scene if it was you maybe would be adding this but we need a environment texture and so let's go ahead and change out environment texture uh, and basically uh, you can see it's pink now pink and blender basically just means there's no material assigned to it uh, but basically what an environment texture is is now we need to find a hdr image uh, that has some lighting and some reflection data baked into it uh, to act as our sunlight and so that's going to be super quick and easy for you beginners again uh, not having to deal with the blender lighting system we're just going to use a image for our lighting that's the reason why i wanted to do a sunlit scene is because sunlight and blender with hdris are super quick and easy so let's go ahead and find that we're going to come back over here to polyhaven again polyhaven is a great great resource if you're a beginner i even use it a ton uh, to this day and so uh you know highly highly recommend that let's come to their hdr uh, hdris and what we need to kind of determine in our scene, let's go uh, back to solid view just so we can see everything. I might go ahead and change my opacity all the way up uh, over here uh, just so I can see this a little bit better. But yeah, so you, we can kind of break this down a little bit. Uh, first thing I want to tell is there's a blue sky. You know, we don't have many clouds in the sky. And then secondly, I kind of want to find any uh, shadows in my scene. There's a lot of shadowing of this awning over here. Um, and especially, you know, closer to our CGI, we can see that there's a lot of shadowing of this kind of part of the roof that's coming over top of it um, the kind of best one over here is actually this tree on the side we can see that uh, it basically gives us a direction and so if we kind of line up the points so it looks like this point is kind of this part of the shadow uh, down here and so we basically can tell that the sun is kind of up in this direction and so we need to match that as uh, kind of perfectly as possible uh, when selecting our HDRI so first, let's come back over here. What I like to do personally is I like to go into the sky settings. Let's go into pure skies. And so pure skies uh, basically is a new thing where it doesn't have any ground texture onto it. If you come to some of the other uh, HDRIs inside of Polyhaven, you'll see that some of them actually have some ground texture. And so that's great if you find an HDRI that perfectly matches up to your uh, 3D environment that you shot in. However, most of the times uh, these aren't going to be as good. And so what I like to do is I like to just, uh, again, I like to use pure skies. So we're going to come over here. Next thing I want to do is I want to figure out, uh, you know, the uh, amount of clouds in here. So there are a ton of clouds over here. What I like to do is if it's a situation where there isn't any clouds in the sky, I like to come to clear. Okay, so finally, we just need to uh, kind of find a sun angle and uh, kind of, you know, luminance value that closely matches to our uh, footage. And so right here, you can see that everything's a little bit warmer on the warmer side in terms of uh, a little bit more orange, if that makes sense. And then I can also tell just from the sun angle that it's, uh, you know, roughly midday um, slash like, you know, uh, mid afternoon, something like that. It's not sunset or morning. And so it's not super long shadows. Uh, it's looking like it's, uh, you know, around 11 to 2, uh, you know, in the midday. 
And so what we need to do is we just need to come over here and kind of view some of these. Um, you can tell like some of these right here, the sun is much lower in the sky. And so it's giving longer shadows. And so that might not be a good HRI to pick. Um, so yeah, so let's go through these. These are two, super low day. Uh, what I want to do is I want to find one that's, uh, you know, a little bit midday. And so right here is a pretty good one. You can see these shadows are a little bit, uh, you know, matching to our environment. Um, there's also this one down here. The reason I like this one better is because it gives us a little bit more of those warmer tones. And so you can see, especially on this white ball, it has a lot more warm light. Whereas down here, it's much cooler. It's much more uh, like white uh, LED light, if that makes sense. So uh, yeah, so this is the one I'm going to choose. That's my process of kind of choosing the correct one. I just download the 4K EXR and just download that. And so that's my whole process of kind of determining uh, the lighting and getting that to match as uh, as well as possible as we can. Okay, so let's go ahead and drag this into the scene now. So we're going to go ahead and open up that environment texture as we had it before. Here is my EXR. So let's open that image. And now we find have some lighting in our scene. I'm just going to quickly shift A and add a mesh plane and we're just going to S to scale that up. And now we can actually see we have some shadow and everything in our scene. And actually, if I come back out here, now you can see the HDRI we picked uh, in the sun direction. Everything is looking good there. So I don't want to see uh, kind of this background. I want to see the transparency of my scene. So let's come over here uh, to the render properties. We just need to go to film and select transparent. And so, yeah, so this is pretty much it. And this is all that we have. Uh, let's do some final things. So first of all, I do want to uh, set the correct rotation of my scene. Uh, you can see the shadows going in the wrong way as uh, compared to our tree over there. So in order to kind of see all of this data, uh, you can come over here and uh, do some stuff here. What I like to do is I like to see the node uh, tree and that it's actually doing in the background. And so we'll come over here to the shader editor. And we'll go instead of object, we can go to world. And so this is the HDRI that we have picked. This is just the node setup that it's doing. Now, a great resource to use and something you're definitely going to run into uh, if you do continue Blender visual effects is you're going to want to enable this add on. So let's go to uh, edit preferences. We'll enable the node regular add on. It's basically just a uh, add on that comes free with Blender. So you don't need to download anything, but it's going to give us a lot of quality of life features there. So again, just make sure that that is checked right there. Uh, but with that, what we can do is let's select this image texture node and hit control and T and that will add a texture coordinate and mapping node. And uh, now we can see this is stuff that uh, is kind of automatically going on in the background. So we basically just unhid that. Uh, and now we can just affect the rotation here. And so let's just move the rotation. I'm trying to use this as reference. I notice our HRI isn't perfect. It's a little bit too long. In my opinion, again, I'm kind of just using the reference of this tree over here to kind of influence that and maybe some of this a little bit over here too. So what I might do is I'll play around with the X ever so slightly so we can just make that a little bit shorter. So something like that is looking much, much better. And so, yeah, so that uh, matches pretty well. Again, I'm just looking at the direction and uh, between the two. And so, yeah, so that matches within reason. I, I feel pretty comfortable with that. So that's how we basically get our lighting and our lighting is, uh, you know, looking good. Again, uh, if you got a, a correct image uh, that's basically being sunlit, this should be everything that we need to do. This is the exact reason I want a sunlit scene for this uh, simple tutorial. So, yeah, so uh, we are in the home stretch now. We are almost ready to render this thing out. Uh, to go into compositing. So some final things I want to do, uh, first of all, is we have this white uh, kind of texture on our plane down here. Uh, let's just quickly demonstrate what that is doing. And so if I select this, I'll make a new material just for demonstration purposes. And I'll put this to be like a red color. And so now you can see on our cat statue, we have a lot of red light bouncing off to it. Uh, and that is to do with how light works in the real world. Basically, the uh, rays of the th of the sun are bouncing off of the floor down here and then reflecting back up into uh, kind of this chest area and everything of the statue. And so that is, uh, you know, all of that to say our ground, we want to be the same color as our ground of our uh, actual scene. Again, this is why I wanted a super simplistic ground. What we would normally do in a situation like this is we would project the texture of our footage onto this uh um, you know, kind of object on our ground, uh, but that gets a little bit too involved. Again, I just want to be as simple as possible since this is most likely going to be your first ever visual effects shot uh, from scratch. And so what we want to do 
Again, I uh, told you guys to select a solid color for the ground. All we're going to do is we're just going to pick select the uh, color of whatever ground that you're using. So I'll pick select that. Uh, we can see it doesn't match perfectly. And so I'm going to come over here. Let's turn the uh, roughness up. Uh, roughness is basically just the reflections of your uh, you know, material. And then uh, same thing with the specular, just kind of uh, some more of the highlights uh, and deals with reflectivity. Uh, so that just turns it all off. We don't want any kind of caustics or anything bouncing uh, weird off of there and so already you can see that's giving us a much uh, more accurate result to how it would look like uh, i'm gonna go and uh i do want to kind of come down here and make sure the connection point uh is fine and so i'm not seeing any kind of weird connection point uh so that's probably what i'm gonna leave it as you can maybe try to match it a little bit better you know if i bump uh, i'll bump the saturation up just ever so slightly something like that looks pretty good so yeah, so that's uh, the exact reason I kind of wanted to do a simple kind of solid ground uh, just so we can literally do a super simple material there. Uh, next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and set up uh, this to be a shadow catcher. And so in the object properties, we'll go to visibility and shadow catcher. And yeah, so now we have uh, this set up and uh, basically it's giving us our shadow uh, and, you know, uh, we're not seeing the actual material and so that's nice uh, i do heavily want to caution you um this is still affecting the lighting of our cat object if i actually didn't have uh, uh, this over here what i'll do is i'll zoom in here and i'll hide the plane you can see that is still affecting our lighting of our cat uh, and so we still want to have this in the scene uh you know when we uh, do this especially down here at kind of the connection point this point is called uh basically the ambient occlusion it's basically when uh, contact points uh, come together, there's a little bit more shading and area and diffusion there. And so uh, if I kind of turn that on and off, you can see, just look how different that looks. You can see with it off, it just looks um, not as realistic at all. It just looks super fake. And with it on, you can see that connection point is there and it's giving us much more accurate lighting. Uh, you'll see in compositing, we're going to do some more fancy stuff with this, but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah, so uh, you know, we have everything set up. Now let's just go ahead and render out some different CGI passes so we can go into compositing. Uh, now the you know, final kind of biggest mistake I feel uh, a lot of beginners make is that they will render this image straight out of Blender and do nothing with it. And uh, that's perfectly fine. You can uh, get pretty good results uh, straight out of Blender. However, they're skipping an entire process of visual effects. And that process is compositing. Compositing, in my opinion, is what takes a all right shot to being uh, next level. And so, you know, personally, when I'm doing visual effects projects, I spend uh, the same, if not more time in compositing just to make sure the visual effects looks that much more realistic. So that's why it's so important. And if uh, there's anything that you take away from this tutorial, it's to go ahead and composite your visual effects. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people just render straight out of Blender and skip compositing altogether. They're just missing out on so much opportunity to make this as realistic as possible. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and get this out to compositing so we can composite this realistically. Uh, now, in order to do that, I do need to organize some stuff over here. So let's make a new collection. I'm just going to name this one. We'll name this Shadow. All we want to do is we basically just want to have two passes. I want to have uh, one of the cat uh, or whatever CGI object that you're doing. And then I want to have one where it's just our shadow pass down here, just so we can affect those separately and, uh, you know, get it a little bit more uh, involved into that kind of process. So with this uh, new collection, we can drag our plane into that collection. And now we have the ability to turn on and off uh, these separate objects. And so what we need to do now, we'll go into the compositing workspace. We need to hit use nodes and we need to go ahead and render out some different passes. So that is what these render layers are for. We can go ahead and shift D. I'll duplicate this. And now you can see we can select uh, different layers of our project. Right now we only have one. And so we do want, uh, you know, basically one view layer per pass that we're going to do. And so uh, that's super quick and easy. I actually love uh, this inside blend. It's one of my favorite things that they have done for visual effects. It's let's uh, come to a new view layer. We're going to name this one cat. And then we're going to create a brand new view layer up here. And we'll just name this one shadow. And so now we have uh, basically two view layers. Let's go back into compositing. And now we can select the uh, shadow view layer down here. And now we basically have two duplicates of our scene that we can turn on the different collections for in order to render out different passes that we need. So let's come back out to layout. 
And for this pass, I want just the uh, cat, basically. We'll switch it to the cat view layer first. So yeah, so we just want the cat. If I come over here, we can disable the shadow collection. However, we actually just did uh, something wrong. If you remember before, we were using that shadow uh, for some of the bounce lighting and it's specifically down here with the connection point in our ambient occlusion. And so instead of disabling it, we still want it to indirectly affect uh, everything that's happening with the cap. And so that's super nice. We can uh, go up here and enable the indirect only filter. And so filters are basically, uh, you know, something only for collections uh, that we can use to differently affect, uh, you know, different collections inside of a sim uh, same view layer. And so all of that to say, we just need to select this to be on for our shadow. And now you can see it's uh, still giving us all of our indirect uh, kind of, you know, collision and stuff. The ambient inclusion looks fine up here. It's still giving us some of that bounce lighting. And so that's kind of the process that we do there to uh, make sure we're not uh, losing data with these different passes. So let's uh, come to the shadow pass now. We just need to do the opposite. We want the cat to be indirect only uh, so that now we have our shadow down here. So again, super quick and easy. Uh, this is literally the most bare bones that you can do in a situation like this and uh, will give us a great result. And so, yeah, so that is pretty much everything broken up. Let's come and go into the compositing section. And now I want to render this stuff out. Let's go ahead uh, and in order to render out multiple passes at the same time, instead of using this composite node up here, I'm going to go ahead and add a file output node. And the file output node is basically just a composite node. However, it allows you to uh, render out multiple things at a time and have different sockets down here. So let's go to node and down to properties. We can see all of these properties now and let's add a input so uh, we basically have two render passes that we're going to render out uh, i'm going to put this one as cat underscore uh, and then i'm going to render this one out as our shadow underscore uh, let's just place the images into the correct sockets so image in there and image into there and so yeah so now uh, this pretty much is going to render wherever we want this uh, to render out to and so uh, let's set some settings uh, the only caveat here if you are used to blender is uh, anything in the output section over here uh, this output section is purely for the composite node and so we're not going to be using the composite node so we can just leave that up here uh, and we don't want to change any uh, these values around these won't do anything for us uh, what we do want to change is in the file output node, we want to change these properties. And so just a little bit of a strange workaround there. Uh, but for me, I'm going to be uh, compositing inside of After Effects today. So I'm going to be sticking with PNG. Uh, After Effects doesn't love EXR. It's a kind of difficult process there. Uh, but we do want alpha, so RGBA for the alpha channel. Uh, compression, since we're just going to be rendering one still frame, uh, I'm going to push this all the way up to 100 because uh, PNG specifically is a lossless format. And so all of this means is it's going to uh, compress our file size down lower. Uh, however, it's going to render out a little bit slower. And so that's uh, the trade off there. Finally, let's just do a new uh, base path and uh, basically render this out wherever you want this to be saved. OK, so I made a new folder for that. Let's hit accept. And yeah, we are pretty much done, I believe. We are ready to render this, render this thing out. So let's go ahead and uh, the nice thing about the file output node is that uh, if you're normally using the composite node, the render image up here actually won't save the file. It'll just give you a preview inside of Blender. However, since we are using the file output node, if we do hit render image, it'll actually save that file out. And so just a nice little thing uh, for that uh, file output node. Okay, so once that frame has finished rendering, we are ready to go ahead and hop into compositing. And so let's back out of here. Uh, first of all, you can see this is the folder I saved into. So we have a cat uh, 0001 and then a shadow 0001. And so you can see this is our cat pass and then this is our shadow pass. And so this is what we're going to be using to get our final composite. So let's go ahead and go into whatever compositing program that you're going to be using. I'm going to be using After Effects since it's so beginner friendly. And so for you absolute beginners out there, After Effects is going to be the program for you. OK, so inside of After Effects, let's go ahead and drag in everything. So our two passes here and then we need to also uh, drag in our original photo. So I'm just going to drag that in. And so, yeah, so first of all, I want to import this in to create a new composition. So I'm just going to drag and drop that into this button down here to create a new composition. Let's drag the cat on top of this. 
So like that, just make a new layer. After Effects is very user friendly because instead of being node based, it's actually layer based. And so for you beginners, it's a little bit of a different process uh, if you're thinking about nodes. And so it just makes it a little bit easier here. Uh, so next thing we need to do, let's just drag this uh, shadow in between here. And now you can see this is the result that we're getting straight out of, uh, you know, Blender and everything there. Uh, and so, yeah, so this doesn't look terrible. There's a lot of stuff wrong with it. And so let's kind of break this down because this is usually uh, the point where I see a lot of beginners leave it and they'll upload it, you know, do their breakdowns and reels and all that stuff. And these are things that are red flags to um, employers. Uh, and so some of those things, first of all, are gray and all of our uh, luminance values are very muted. And so as you can see back here, we have some nice reference of like some uh, black dark areas. And then we also have some nice reference of some white areas and stuff here. And so as you can see here, uh, everything, the blacks are too uh, light. And then the uh, highlight values, so like uh, there's some white up here and everything, looks too gray. And so we need to uh, correct our luminance and levels there. Uh, and so that's the first thing that uh, some you know people would be kind of looking for. The second is I'm not totally happy with the connection point down here, the ambient occlusion, if you will. Um, I w I want to get this to look a little bit more integrated and like uh, you know the cat is actually in the scene. It looks a little amateurish, uh, amateurish there. Uh, finally, the big red flag here, and you could probably tell this already, uh, is the shadow down here. And so the shadow uh, looks nothing like the other shadows in the scene, and so we have to break that out and uh, get that to look a little bit more realistic. Okay, so first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and just focus on the cat. I kind of like to break uh, things down step by step. The first thing for the cat is I want to affect the levels. And so let's select our cat layer down here. And I want to go into effect controls. Let's add a new uh, color correction effect. So I'm going to go to effects, color correction. And uh, typically I like to use curves uh, for my luminance value changes. Uh, you could use levels. Uh, we'll be using levels a little bit later. Uh, but for luminance values and all that stuff, I like to use curves down here. Uh, so by default, it's set to RGB, and that's totally fine. I'm going to keep it super simple for you guys. But you can change this and break it out to the individual channels if you so want. Uh, but anyway, so we have RGB here. Let's go ahead and, uh, you know, this is looking a little too dark for me overall. And so the middle values are all of our kind of mid-tones. And so mid-tones, if you want to think about it, it's just gray values, uh, values that, you know, are a little bit on the middle end of the spectrum in terms of how dark they are. And that's a very kind of, you know, simplistic uh, kind of explanation. Uh, the other side, this is all of the black areas. And then these are all of the white areas or the uh, highlights, if you want to say like that. So anyway, so uh, let's kind of break this down. First of all, I kind of want to bump everything up. So that is uh, the gamma. And so let's just bump the gamma up. So something around there is looking pretty good uh, for this. I'm just going to eyeball it. Um, usually what will happen is they'll go in and actually like pick points of the, uh, you know, the lightest pixels and the darkest pixels to match them. Uh, but I'm not going to have to worry about that f uh, for you guys. Uh, let's bring the darks ever so slightly down. So that is this area down here. Let's bring those down a little bit. Just trying to match this area to some of these areas down here. So something like that is looking a little bit more interesting. And then finally, the white values. Uh, I'll notice we have like a little bit of white values over here. And then some of our sunlight spots, uh, you know, down here uh, might need to be, be a little bit higher. So that is this area up here. I'll just kind of bring this ever so slightly up. I don't want to go too much because, um, you know, since it is a gray material, it wouldn't be totally white. It'd still be a little bit of gray. But yeah, so now you can see our whites are matching a little bit better. So again, overall, uh, bumping up the gamma, uh, bumping up the highlights a little bit there, and then bumping down the uh, kind of dark points there. And so that's all I'm doing uh, to kind of break those down. And so, yes, yeah, so that automatically looks so much better. You can see uh, just if I turn that on and off, uh, it just sits in the scene much better in terms of lighting. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's pretty much all I'm going to do for the curves. I could maybe play around with that a little bit more later. Uh, next thing I want to do is I want to match the focus level. And so as you can see now, everything is super, super sharp on my cap. And so I want to make this uh, be a little bit more, more defocused, like some of these branches and stuff back here. So what we can do, is we'll add a new effect. We'll go to blur. And then camera lens blur is the one I like using for that. Uh, by default, it's set to five pixels. Uh, I believe for this shot, I ended up being a 0.2 uh, pixel blur. And so it might be hard to see on YouTube, uh, but that is matching a little bit better. All you want to do here is just uh, find 
in the Z space, uh, you know, a kind of reference point. And so I'm using like some of this stuff as reference, this line down here, and basically just trying to match the edge blur um, of that. And so you can see that matches a little bit better now. Again, just super subtle for this scene since uh, the camera, uh, it honestly looks like a phone camera. And so phone cameras don't have a lot of depth of field uh, or blur in that case. So yeah, so those are the two things that make it match uh, a lot better. Let's go ahead and deal with the shadow because the shadow is the next thing. So how do we use, uh, uh, utilize our shadow and make it look a lot more realistic? If we kind of come up here, I can kind of demonstrate this. Uh, you can see the shadow in the background is influenced by the color and the reflectiveness of uh you know whatever that shadow is hitting so as you can see here this is like a darker uh kind of brown color however up here since the material is more of a lighter brown color uh we're getting you know some different shadowing and different effects up here uh than down here down here basically what is happening right now is it's basically just a one solid layer uh, and basically has a little bit of opacity down and so you can see exactly what that is basically doing back here and so what we need to do instead of using this as a layer we need to use this shadow as a mask and so uh, all we need to do it's super nice and easy instead of after effects let's go ahead and uh, duplicate our footage and so the um, you know image that you're using you just want to make a new layer down here and if you don't see this we're going to be using this track mat you can just toggle these switches in mode down here until you see track map uh, but track map, all it does is it it's going to take the alpha channel of the uh, layer that we select and it's going to use that alpha channel as a mask. And so since we already have this shadow kind of layer up here, we're going to use that uh, alpha to influence the mask of that layer. So if I select shadow right there, uh, you can see it's vanished. And what's actually happening if I kind of disable and hide the uh, lower layer is now uh, this layer by default is basically just uh, having that alpha applied to it. And so this is the only part that it's affecting. The reason this is nice is because now we actually have the pixels data that we can actually use for the shadow and color to get it a little bit more accurate. And so that's going to kind of dial it in like I was showing up there, how, uh, you know, whatever material it's going to be bouncing off of is actually going to affect uh, how the shadow looks. Uh, so, yeah, so all we need to do is uh, this is our kind of shadow layer now. Let's come up to effect. Uh, this is where I want to go ahead and go into color correction and I'll use levels this time. I find for anything, uh, you know, shadowing or ambient occlusion or anything to do with like more black values. Uh, I like using the levels um, color correction. You can, of course, use curves if you're more uh, kind of uh, used to curves there as well. But um, yeah, so this is where I want to go ahead and break up the shadow. And so what I could do is I'll bump the uh this is the gamma slider down so we can bump that down that's looking pretty good i'll bump this uh kind of down as well so something like that uh, is looking pretty good and i believe if we bump this white thing down it also kind of bring over the overall um like offset value so yeah, so that's looking much, much better. And so you can see that is giving us this result now. What I might do, everything's a little bit too red here. And if I kind of go to some of the other, um, you know, things we can see up here, especially on this white, post area here everything's a little bit more blue hue especially down here uh, you can see a lot more uh, kind of blue and green values um, and that is a little bit to do with the grass over here uh, but we want to try to recreate that as much as possible so let's come over here to the red channel i'll just dial the gamma of the red down so something like that and automatically that's doing a much much better job uh, and now you can see uh, we're getting much better shadows down here and it's looking a lot more integrated into the environment uh, so here here is what we had before you can see it's a black blob mess and stuff and then this is after you can see we're getting a lot more uh, better fall off and uh, the colors are matching much more accurately and so, yes, yeah, so that is uh, looking pretty good. Uh, we're dealing with a little bit of compression issues and stuff like that. So that is the unfortunate thing. Um, you know, in a client like this, I'd probably send it through a denoiser and denoise some of that. And uh, of course, we have this grass over here. And so uh, the grass is not perfectly flat. However, our shadow looks a little bit perfectly flat. Uh, I'm not going to really worry about that. That's getting a little too nitpicky uh, for what I want to accomplish with this tutorial. Anyways, uh, that looks pretty decent. I think it's a little bit too sharp. You know, if I kind of come back here, um, we'll see that the sun is very sharp. However, um, I think it's due to the focus, you know, how we defocused it before. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, defocus it a little bit. Let's go to effect and I'll go to blur and sharpen. Instead of using camera lens blur for this, I'm just going to use a Gaussian blur. So right here, and we'll just bump that blurriness up. 
Oh, um, you know, quickly, I am doing it to the wrong layer. I'm doing it to uh, my, uh, basically the track mat layer. I want to do it to the alpha layer that we're using. So we'll select this shadow and now we'll go to effect blur and Gaussian blur. Uh, so now again, because we're using the alpha from that layer, it is a uh, different there. So we do have to be working in our shadow layer. Uh, but yeah, so now you can see that's uh, basically blurred it ever so slightly. Again, not too much, uh, and it might be a little bit hard to tell, but especially on this corner, you can see it's just helping that match a lot better. And so yeah, so that is uh, you know our shadow done. The final step that I want to do that I really think uh, makes and breaks uh, these type of realistic shots is the connection point. And when I talk about that, I'm mainly talking about the ambient occlusion. And so right down here, uh, it's actually not terrible for this shot. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, pretty accurate there. However, uh, I might want to try to cheat that a little bit more just to kind of blend in uh, this cat to make sure it's actually, you know, uh, looks like it's sitting on the ground in the real world. So, uh, you know, normally I'm a new compositor, and so this might not be the total accurate way to do it uh, inside of uh, After Effects. However, this is the method that I've used uh, before for these type of shots is let's go ahead and I want to basically create um, some uh, color correction around this cap. And then I also want to uh, basically color correct and have a layer uh, just for around the cat on the floor. So we'll do the cat one first. So I'm just going to duplicate my cat layer like that so it's just a pure duplication now i only want to color correct um this bottom portion right here so in order to do that i'm just going to mask out the uh, area that i want so i'm just selecting this pin tool up here so select that and we can just kind of zoom in i just want to kind of create a little bit of an edge outline over here i may be going inside of the object maybe like you know five pixels um like two to five pixels i'm not being super accurate in here uh, just a very rough mask it also helps that it's a still scene um, you know, so I can get away with that. But yeah, so I'm just making a uh, kind of crude little mask down here and let's connect it back up onto the side. And so there, uh, now we basically have this layer. If I uh, delete the other layer, you can see that it's, uh, you know, ever so slightly just uh, the bottom section of our cat there. What I'm actually going to do is let's go into the mask settings, um, which is which one? There are two masks here. I actually created a duplicate. Whoops. So we'll go to mask one is what I had before. And let's uh, change up uh, the feather up. And so that'll just feather that out a little bit. And we might need to move this around. Uh, you can see basically now it's just selecting the bottom of our cat object right there. And so now with that, now that we have that set up and it's over top of our uh, previous cat layer, what we can do is uh, in this top cat layer, we can add another effect. We'll go to color correction and go to levels. And all we want to do is we simply just want to make everything a little bit darker. And so it might be a little bit hard to see and I might need to adjust my mask. But now you can see just on that cat, we can see at the connection point, it's getting it much, much darker around that area. So yeah, so what I'm going to do is let's go back to our mask. So let's select this mask and I'm just going to select everything. So we'll select all of our objects. I hate, I hate the way mask work inside of a, uh, After Effects, it's very finicky sometimes. Uh, so let's select all of these. There we go. And I'll just move these ever so slightly up. And yes, yeah, so that's giving us a little bit more area. And so uh, what is that? More of like a 10 pixel uh, edge gap right there. So anyways, we can come back over here and this is where we can dial in a little bit more. Uh, so as you can see, I'm just adding some more uh, ambient occlusion and stuff there. I do believe there are some ways you can do it with uh, some passes inside of Blender. However, again, that gets a little bit more complicated into all of those processes there. So yeah, so uh, if I turn this layer on and off, you can see we're getting more of that ambient occlusion. And so that's really nice. And I feel like it's tying the shot uh, and a lot more, uh, you don't want to overdo it, you know, because, uh, it, it is, um, you know, it definitely can be overdone. And the final thing I want to do is I kind of want to add some ambient occlusion on the ground. You can still see if we zoom really tight in, there's still a little bit of a uh, kind of noticeable, uh, seam and line here. And so we're basically going to do the exact same process, but now opposite for the ground. And so, uh, in order to do that, let's go ahead and I'll select We'll go ahead and select uh, the original footage, I believe. So select that and duplicate that. And I'll place this above our shadow and everything there. And all I want to do is I want to go ahead and just mask out the same kind of line over here, but now on the ground. And so again, we're just doing that like five to 10 pixel area on the ground around here. 
Uh, we don't have to be super precise because we are going to be feathering it uh, and, you know, expanding that out just so it, you know, doesn't look purely opaque. So right there. And yeah, so that looks pretty good. I might also get some bit of that area. So yeah, so now uh, we pretty much have that. Let's connect this back up. And yeah, so now we have this and this is where we want to go ahead and uh, color correct this some more. So I'm going to uh, feather our mask. So our feather, we'll, we'll just do it something like that. And so, yeah, so now you can see this is the same exact process. Uh, this layer is going to be on top of our other layer, just acting as an additional kind of color correction in that specific area. So let's go to effect. And I like to use the levels again or any shadows. And I'll just bring this black number down. And so we'll keep decreasing that. You know, I kind of get a little bit tight in over here. But yeah, so now I'm not, I'm getting rid of some of that line, uh, those harsh seams over there. And so, yeah, so that's helping a little bit. Um, what I might do is I might come back and play around with the feather ever so slightly again. So something like that is looking good. And then I might also select the path again. So right down here, double click inside of here. And let's just move this up. So we'll move it up to like there. Yeah, that's looking much, much better. And so, yeah, so I can play around with this a little bit more, try to get it a little bit more dialed in. But you can just see ever so slightly, we're just adding some more ambient occlusion back into the ground of our object here. Uh, so, yeah, so that's pretty much the exact process. You can see it's blending in, especially like these uh, kind of darker areas over here. It's bl helping blend that in a little bit more. Um, and that's exactly what ambient occlusion would do in the real world. And so, yeah, so that's pretty much it and uh, kind of all the processes I would do. Now, I actually uh, spend a little bit more time just kind of dialing in all these those numbers. Uh, compositing is kind of a more time consuming process. So I'm not going to show uh, technically like everything I'm doing, uh, but this is kind of the final result. We were able to basically go uh, from this is, you know, typically what I see with a lot of beginners, you know, straight out of Blender, not doing any compositing. Uh, and if you get really, really tied into here, it starts to stand out, you know, especially down here. You know, it looks very fake, very, uh, you know, uh, computer generated. And so uh, just with a little bit of compositing and some stuff there, we are able to get this, which is a much kind of nicer result, sits much nicer in the scene. And if uh, you gave this to a friend or anything like that, um, you, you know, they would question, uh, is that re really there or, you know, what there? So, yeah. So if I kind of just turn those on and off, you can see uh, kind of that, uh, that switch. And so, yeah, so th that is pretty much my entire process uh, that I go through to uh, get a shot like this. Again, if you are learning visual effects, this tutorial, I cannot stress this enough. Instead of doing all of the flashy things such as camera tracking, you know, modeling, uh, you know, animation, all that stuff or whatever. If you can nail down these concepts, you know, maybe do two or three of these shots where you're literally uh, going down uh, all the way down to the pixel level. I'm telling you, client uh, clients and uh you know potential employers if they're looking at your demo reel and stuff are going to be zooming in all the way here to check uh your work and everything like that especially with your breakdown because they can see the before and after of everything there and so yeah so that's pretty much it um i hope you guys have gotten a lot of information out of this tutorial i know again it wasn't the most glamorous but um you know it's very important to nail this concept down uh anyways thank you so so much for watching uh, i have a course if you are more interested in some more of the advertising visual effects side of things and i also have one where we go through literally everything learning blender from scratch specifically for visual effects so i'll have both of those links down below if you are interested anyways thanks so so much for watching and i will see you in the next video